Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you this morning. Let me add my welcome to Tim's. Um, yeah, it's so good to have you here and everyone joining us online. Uh, we're in week two of um, the church, God's living community. And this week we're thinking about a new humanity. Um, so do, if you've got a Bible, um, if you need a Bible, the stewards will bring one. So please uh, do lift your hand if you've not got a Bible um, and a steward, steward will bring one to you. Um, this morning there are also some questions for the young people. So if you haven't got questions and you're a young person and would like them, uh, raise your hand and they'll be brought to you as well. But let us turn and read Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 13 to 18. Ephesians 2, verse 13 to 18. And I should say, you can probably tell I'm sounding a little bit croaky. Um, I have got a bit of a cough. I've done several COVID tests. It was absolutely not COVID, just in case you're sitting there and that's causing concern. Um, so Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create, create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Amen and may God bless his word to us this morning. Well, I wonder if, if you've ever thought about why there is so much division everywhere we look. There is so much division in the world. Uh, let's start with the really obvious politics. Over the last week, because of the health and social care changes, we've seen division. A few weeks go by when we don't see this. Uh, what about division in families? The divorce rate is around 42%. That is, that's a lot of division. Some family members don't ever speak to each other. And division between families seems to be the bread and butter of most British soaps. But what about school friends and colleagues? Do you ever fall out with each other? Or you have a, a heated text message discussion and stop speaking for a period. Uh, we see division between countries. It impacts trade, negotiations, travel, aid. There's been division with France this week over migrants. What about in church? There's never division in church, is there? What about if God's plan is so much better? What about if this thing we call church is meant to be a place of something significantly different to all the other division we see in the world? Somewhere that stands out for its oneness and its unity. A place without barriers and division. A new humanity like nothing else. Unlike anything before it, a place of peace and reconciliation with a common uniting factor which overlooks any difference. How do we get this? How can this be possible? And how can we be part of it? Well, let's find out this morning as we look at God's words but first, we need to look at some major division in the Bible. So firstly, we're going to think about division between each other. And the division in our passage is between Jew and Gentile. Gentiles being non-Jews. 
The Jews strongly disliked the Gentiles. They were not God's people. They were unclean. Jew and Gentile hated each other. Uh, Bitterness reigned through them. Uh, Loathing dominated their thoughts. Well, here's how the division played out. Uh, There's an illustration in verse 14 of our passage. It says, Christ, who is our peace, and made the two groups one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, now this is a vivid picture that um, the original readers would have got really quickly. It pictures a wall outside the temple. Uh, Here is a, a picture of the temple. I know it's very detailed, but notice how far the wall out is with the arrow pointing to it saying, dividing wall. The little tiny people in the picture, if you can even see them, give you an indication of the scale. The Gentiles were not allowed beyond this outside wall. Uh, And so a picture of the outer court um, of the temple where the Gentiles could be. Inside that was the, the the court of the Israelites. Inside that was the court of the priests. Inside that was the holy place. And inside that was the holy of holies. And the Gentiles could only go to the outer court. That's where they could go to worship. And on this wall which divided them was a marble screen or a plaque. Historians call it uh, the law of purity. And this is what it said in Greek. No Gentile may enter without, within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure, anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So if a Gentile walked beyond the wall, he knew the consequence. It was death. Now imagine if we're all Jews in the inner court uh, this morning, when suddenly... A Gentile walks in the back. Karen, great timing. Death to you as she's carried off to a prison to await the penalty. That is how serious the division was. It kept the Gentiles out and summarizes the relationship between Jew and Gentile. But God's plan was always to bring the Gentiles near to himself right into the holy of holies. Isaiah prophesied uh, 700 years earlier, chapter 57, verse 19, peace to those who are far off. A great verse that should have been in the Jewish mind. Peace, not hostility, to those who are far off. Jesus came and he wanted to bring Jew and Gentile together as one in himself. And so in verse 15, Jesus, it says, Jesus came and he set aside in his flesh. He abolished or wiped out through his death the barrier between Jew and Gentile. Now to set aside or be abolished means the division is completely gone forever. And in doing so, Christ creates one new humanity, division between each other removed forever. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Through the cross, through his blood, one new humanity was made, a new humanity in Christ Jesus, a new people making up the church with the foundation being Christ. United in position and privilege, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. But hang on a minute. 
Sorting out relationships with each other is one thing, Jew and Gentile, but what about a far bigger division? And so secondly, division between us and God. Now Paul is is super clear in Ephesians about our spiritual state. Turn with me to chapter 2 verse 1. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We were dead. Now, what can a dead person do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're utterly helpless. Uh, Spiritually, we were dead. It's the case of everyone who follows uh, the ways of this world, uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan. When we don't walk with God, we are dead in our sins, deserving of wrath. This is how we all were at one point. Verse 3 of chapter 2 is also really clear. It says, at one time we were gratifying the cravings of our flesh. We all loved the world following its desires and thoughts. So the other week, the elders met at church and I popped out to buy some milk from the co-op, walking past bar 189 next door. And outside was a pop-up vendor uh, selling Mexican street food. Uh, The smell was absolutely amazing. And I was craving for this food for the rest of the evening as I came back in. The Bible says we crave the world. We crave its thinking and its ways. Uh, Verse 12 in chapter 2 picks up on this and tells us what this therefore means. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded, foreigners, without hope and without God. that, That is a pretty desperate state to be in. You might take the list and think, well, as long as I keep having hope, I'll be fine. But there is no lasting hope without God. And to be separate from Christ means you just keep facing God's anger. It's it's a perilous state. And and this isn't just the the pre-church humanity, how humanity existed 2,000 years ago before Christ. It's also the non-church humanity. It's how humanity are today, who are outside the church and who don't belong to Christ. It's a terrible position. You know, just just imagine for a moment with me that we were still looking for a COVID vaccine. If every test they had carried out on a vaccine still had serious side effects, And the risks were just too high to roll it out. Where would we be? What would life be like? We would probably still be in lockdown. Uh, The NHS, overwhelmed. With the outlook pretty bleak. Or imagine every time a variant came, the existing vaccine was deemed useless. And I had to start all over again. Without Christ, the outlook is so bleak and there is no hope. And so those those with Christ, with the answer, the cure to life itself, should stand out an absolute mile. That those outside the church see something so much better, a new awesome humanity, with Christ at the center. So what did Christ do for us? Well, we we needed someone to intervene and do something. We were dead. And the key word comes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. We'll start in verse 4. It says, but God, because of his great love for us, because he is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. He made us alive. 
He breathed new life into us. Christ took the bigger wall of hostility, that of sin, and he smashed it to pieces. He died for our sins and brought us near by his blood and flesh. Christ himself is our peace and faith in Christ unites us all, creating this new humanity. And this is, this is by far the bigger division, division between us and God removed. In a moment, we, we will signify our oneness by sharing in the Lord's Supper together. What a symbol of our new humanity that we belong to Christ. We eat and drink together. But individually, it also changes and shapes us. We are now in Christ. So how we speak or think or act is being changed. Our attitudes, or our agendas, our motives are changed in Christ. So I heard a story this week of a man who has a terrible neighbour and essentially wanted to punch his lights out. But being a Christian, it caused this man to show restraint and act differently to how others almost certainly would. We display the fruit of the Spirit, that of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So yes, individually, but, but corporately too, this makes a massive difference. We are a new humanity. And here's the thing. If the greater division between us and God has been removed through Christ and his death on the cross, through the blood of Jesus, if we can have access to God in Christ himself, then that should stir our hearts to not want any division with anyone else in the church. Why would we want any other barriers between us? We have been chosen to display the best humanity possible without division. A place where all are welcome, where there are no walls of hostility. A place without divide. A place where diversity is celebrated. And we must therefore keep a check on ourselves and ask the question, are there any barriers among us? Does income or employment divide us? Does our background cause any division? What about our skin colour or ethnicity? Are we divided by age? Or what about gender? Or what about marital status? Or even our personalities? What does this new humanity that we've been called to display look like? Not just to us, but to everyone else around us. Who do we invite over to eat with us? Is it always a certain type of family or group? Do we have blind spots to those that we don't love and encourage? I wonder who we all gravitate to at coffee time. We're going to be watching each other today and who we're speaking to. Do the young speak with the old? Who in your heart do you know that you're avo avoiding? Does anyone among us ever feel left out? Do we always talk to those we feel safe and comfortable with? We're to display our oneness as a new humanity throughout church life. In Christ, we are to love all who love Jesus the same, everyone the same, because we are one new humanity. Uh, recently in the news, uh, it's been reported just very recently 
there have been some big fences put up. Countries putting fences up. But Lithuania, Poland, Greece. Why are these fences being put up? It's to stop migrants and Afghan refugees from entering. Many people fleeing for their lives, trying to reach countries for safety, to then find no entry, rejected. What fences do we put up between ourselves and each other? Where might people feel unwanted or rejected? Christ came to remove the fence, to break down the barriers. Remember, the alienation is gone. The wall of hostility has been broken down. And so just consider what this should look like. What a fantastic evangelistic tool this should be. Mixing and helping with others that no one else in the world would. Making sure that every single divide that the world makes, well, we can be a light. A new humanity showing the difference our faith in Christ makes. That we are all one. And that the challenges around us everywhere, I think, when you walk outside, whether school or, or work or in our streets, those people we see ignored by others. We see cliques of people gathering while others are excluded. So while I was at school, um, you had different groups. It can't have changed that much, young people. I'm sure you still have these groups. You have the cool, sporty group. You have the academic group. You have the super trendy group on those dress down days, anyway. Uh, you have the gaming group. You, you had the goth group when I was at school. Or you have those not in any group walking about by themselves. But here in this new humanity, in the church, all walls are broken down. Whatever your interests or abilities, whether male or female, whatever language or ethnicity, in Christ, we are all one. And all are welcome to be part of this new humanity. In Jesus Christ, you are welcome to come, to trust in Jesus and belong to this new humanity. Yes, he will convict you of sin and repentance is needed. But you will go from being dead to being alive. And you will become part of the most diverse family on the planet. I was so pleased that Philippa used this verse earlier. John writes these words in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. Come and be part of a great multitude that no one will be able to count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. A new humanity worshipping together before Jesus. What a picture forever and ever. All are welcome to come into that family. Let us pray. Let's just take a moment to be quiet and maybe reflect on areas in our lives where we have these barriers, where we're not living as one in Christ. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that the old has gone and the new has come and that you have made us uh, one new humanity in the Lord Jesus Christ through his death. But as we come before you, Lord Jesus, who so clearly demonstrated that one humanity on earth as your body this morning, we must repent. Lord, forgive us where we create division 
Forgive us where we don't love our brother or sister as we should. Lord, forgive us where we have preferences within the church. Forgive us when we put up walls of hostility. And forgive us when we don't demonstrate this new humanity to all outside the church. Oh Lord, we need your help. Thank you that your spirit is at work. Thank you that you are breaking down these walls and these barriers. Lord, help us to keep loving each other and looking out for each other, we pray. We thank you so much for the church. Thank you that you are at work here in this place. We praise your name. We worship you. Amen.